Back in 1995, a doomsday cult in Japan carried out a simultaneous attack using sarin gas on Tokyo's subway system. Japan witnessed a doomsday like never before in the year 1995, when a cult decided to unleash a horrifying attack on the Tokyo subway, releasing deadly sarin gas. A frightening development this morning. A chemical weapon, nerve gas, was released inside a crowded subway system in Tokyo today. Causing widespread devastation and panic. But what led to this social outburst and chaos? Well, the answer is just the tip of the iceberg in the many stories about the deep secret and manipulative lives of cult leaders. You people have done everything in the world to me. Doesn't that give me equal right? So stay put as we unveil unsettling interviews with the most evil cult leaders in history. Jim Jones, the People's Temple, led by Jim Jones, tragically grabbed worldwide attention when, on November 18, 1978, about 900 members of the church perished in a devastating act of murder-suicide at their compound in Jonestown, Guyana. It was a heart-wrenching event that left people stunned and saddened. As a young child, Jones found solace in attending church, and after graduating from Butler University, he followed his passion and became a minister. In the vibrant city of Indianapolis during the 1950s and 60s, Jones gained a reputation as a captivating preacher, enchanting people with his supposed psychic powers and miraculous healings. He was admired for his dedication to racial integration, a stance that, sadly, led to conflicts with some church leaders. In 1955, Jones established the Wings of Deliverance, a Pentecostal church that eventually transformed into the People's Temple. During this period, he became known for his sincere efforts to help the homeless, and in the early 1960s, he dedicated himself to serving as the director of the Human Rights Commission in Indianapolis. However, as fears of a nuclear war grew, Jones decided to move his church to Northern California in 1965. First, they settled near Ukiah, and later, in 1971, they found a new home in San Francisco. It was during this time that Jones, now known as the Prophet, seemingly developed an insatiable hunger for power. Troubling allegations surfaced, accusing him of unlawfully diverting the congregation's funds for personal gain. Despite these mounting accusations, Jones and hundreds of followers chose to start anew in Guyana, establishing the commune called Jonestown in 1977. Within the walls of Jonestown, Jones wielded complete control his actions becoming more disturbing and manipulative. He confiscated passports and millions of dollars, instilling fear in his followers through blackmail, beatings, and the constant threat of death. The most chilling revelation was the preparation for a macabre rehearsal of a mass suicide. The People's Temple, initially founded as an independent congregation in the 1950s, attracted a predominantly African-American membership drawn to Jones's vision of a united and integrated community. The group officially affiliated with the Christian Church, Disciples of Christ, in 1960, and Jones was ordained as a minister four years later. The movement expanded, establishing branch congregations in San Francisco and Los Angeles, while Jonestown, an agricultural settlement, was founded in 1974. Jones's ideology, Influenced by Marxist liberation theology, popular among Latin American clergy at the time, blended social concerns, faith healing, and a vibrant worship style inspired by the traditions of the black church. Living communally was encouraged, as it was seen as a means to achieve the utopian ideals envisioned by Jones. However, the People's Temple faced mounting accusations of financial fraud, physical abuse of members, and mistreatment of children under its care, tarnishing its reputation. In 1977, Jones led hundreds of followers to Guyana, seeking isolation and sanctuary from the scrutiny of the outside world. A year later, a group of concerned former members called Concerned Relatives managed to persuade U.S. Congressman Leo J. Ryan to visit Jonestown. The visit initially appeared to go well, but tragically, at the airport, while preparing to depart, Ryan and his accompanying delegation were brutally murdered. The events that followed were nothing short of a catastrophic tragedy, as the majority of Jonestown's inhabitants, caught in a web of manipulation and fear, 
participated in a mass ritual of murder-suicide. They took their own lives either through gunfire or by consuming poison. Out of the 918, 914 died, including Jim Jones himself, leaving only four people left alive. In the aftermath of this horrific event, the remaining members of the People's Temple in California formally disbanded, left to grapple with immense sorrow and loss. Jim Jones, once hailed by his followers, became synonymous with evil, a leader who exploited and deceived those who placed their trust in him. The pain and anguish caused by this mass murder are indescribable, leaving a lasting impact on the lives of those affected and the collective memory of a nation. Warren Jeffs Have you heard about the shocking lawsuit that slammed the church in July 2004 with the popular Warren Jeffs as the sole defendant? Jeffs, the president of the Fundamentalist Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, FLDS, was accused by his nephew, Brent Warren, of assaulting him and his brother during the 1980s at a church compound. Under his self-proclaimed religious authority lurked a much darker reality. Warren Jeffs was a child molester, a sex offender, and one of America's most wanted men. The situation took an even more tragic turn when Brent's brother, unable to bear the mental anguish inflicted by the abuse, tragically took his own life. But this disturbing revelation was just the tip of the iceberg when it came to the crimes attributed to Warren Jeffs. Many people referred to him as the embodiment of evil, the devil in human form. The FLDS, a polygamous movement, believed that only one person could communicate with God on behalf of the faithful, and to them, that person was Warren Jeffs. In 2002, he assumed leadership of the FLDS from his father, marrying all his father's wives and adding 40 women to his harem. Shockingly, Jeffs even married his own daughters and nieces, perpetuating a cycle of abuse within his own family. This man was a twisted beast, manipulating and brainwashing his followers into believing he was a revered man of God, all while committing heinous sins behind closed doors. By 2006, Jeffs had officially earned a spot on the FBI's 10 most wanted list for his involvement in child marriages and a multitude of other crimes. He went into hiding, leaving behind his 75 wives at the church's community home, which was later discovered by the police. Eventually, he was apprehended by a highway trooper in Nevada due to an obscured license plate on his red 2007 Cadillac Escalade. Jeffs's arrest revealed a cache of disguises, including four computers, 16 cell phones, three wigs, and 12 pairs of sunglasses. He was also found in possession of over $55,000 in cash. Extradited to Texas, Warren Jeffs faced justice and was found guilty on two counts of assault, receiving a maximum sentence of life imprisonment. However, it was during his time in prison that the true drama of his life unfolded. Failing in numerous attempts to take his own life, Jeffs claimed to have undergone a spiritual transformation. He professed to have realized his mistakes and sought forgiveness from God. In interviews conducted while incarcerated, he even claimed that God had visited him in his cell and delivered prophecies. Jeffs embarked on dangerous hunger strikes, aligning himself with absurd end-time predictions, which some believed were a mere ploy for attention, while others considered him mentally unstable. Regardless of the truth, Warren Jeffs will forever be remembered as a sinister cult leader, leaving an indelible mark on the fundamentalist Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in the world. Their organization, once viewed as a religious institution, now carries the stain of scandal, abuse, and the exploitation of innocent lives. David Koresh The standoff between federal agents and the Branch Davidians in Waco, Texas, was a big news story that lasted for months. It all started on February 28, 1993, when federal law enforcement agents confronted the Branch Davidians outside their home, called the Mount Carmel Compound. The group had about 130 people living there and considered themselves students of the Bible. The agents wanted to arrest their leader, David Koresh, and search their 77-acre property. But things turned violent and a shootout broke out. In the end, Four agents and six Branch Davidians died. After the shootout, there was a 51-day standoff. 
Koresh and most of his followers refused to leave the compound, which was surrounded by tanks, armored vehicles, and over 600 federal agents. The standoff ended on April 19, 1993, when a fire broke out and destroyed the compound. Only nine people survived. Many people called what happened in Waco a massacre. David Koresh, whose real name was Vernon Howell, was the leader of the Branch Davidians. He took over in 1987 after the previous leader died. Koresh believed he could talk to God and made predictions about the second coming of Christ and the end of the world. He had followers from different countries and was known for having multiple wives, some of whom were underage. The Waco standoff began because authorities believed Koresh had a large number of weapons in the compound. They wanted to arrest him for having illegal weapons and search the property. According to records, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms thought the group had almost 250 ammunitions, including guns and grenades. The ATF said the Branch Davidians started shooting at them first, but the surviving members of the group deny this. The shootout resulted in a total of 10 deaths. The remaining adults and children barricaded themselves inside the compound and refused to come out. During the 51-day standoff, the FBI negotiated the release of 44 people. They had conversations with Koresh for about 60 hours. However, the negotiations stalled when Koresh kept delaying his surrender. Tensions escalated on April 19, 1993, when the FBI moved their tanks closer to the compound and used tear gas. A fire broke out and the building burned down. In the aftermath, they found 75 people dead, including Koresh. Many had been shot, and even a three-year-old boy was found stabbed in the chest. David Thibodeau, one of the survivors, believes the FBI shot some of the Branch Davidians. The FBI denies this and says they didn't fire any bullets after the initial shootout. Thibodeau also thinks that some Branch Davidians might have chosen to end their lives to avoid a painful death in the fire. There is still disagreement about who started the fire. The FBI says the people inside the compound started it, but the Branch Davidians say the FBI was responsible. An independent investigation found that the fire started from inside the building, but it's still a disputed point. Thibodeau is certain that nobody inside would have started the fire intentionally. Charles Manson Charles Manson, born on November 12, 1934 in Cincinnati, Ohio, was a cult leader and serial killer, notorious for his association with the Manson family. In 1968, Manson began promoting a very deadly idea aimed at starting a race war while exhibiting a personality reminiscent of a comic book villain. Manson's early life was marked by a troubled upbringing. His mother, involved in armed robbery, was imprisoned when Manson was conceived. As a child, he engaged in delinquent behavior, frequently skipping school and stealing. His criminal activities escalated, leading to multiple stints in reform schools and facilities for troubled boys. In 1956, Manson received his first adult prison sentence, initiating an 11-year cycle of incarceration and release. This pattern continued until his release from a correctional facility in Washington State in 1967, at the age of 32. After his release, Manson found a place within San Francisco's counterculture movement, positioning himself as a self-proclaimed spiritual leader. He attracted vulnerable young women seeking a sense of belonging and formed a cult known as the Manson Family. Manson and his followers embarked on a journey along the West Coast before settling at the infamous Spawn Ranch in 1968. At Spawn Ranch, Manson propagated his spiritual teachings, heavily influenced by drug use and his aspirations of becoming a successful musician. However, Manson's violent tendencies resurfaced, leading to a series of brutal murders in July 1969. The victims included musician Gary Hinman and actress Sharon Tate, along with four others. Law enforcement eventually apprehended Manson and his followers in October 1969 after evading capture for two months. They were arrested for car theft, but were later charged with multiple counts of first-degree murder. During the indictment, Manson's belief in an impending race war was revealed. He claimed that black people would initiate widespread violence against white people, and his cult would emerge from hiding to rule over the remaining population. In 1971, Manson and his followers Tex Watson, Susan Atkins, Patricia Krenwinkel, and Leslie Van Houten were found guilty. Initially sentenced to death, 
Their sentences were commuted to life imprisonment when California abolished the death penalty the following year. Manson spent the rest of his life in the California State Prison in Cochrane. He died of natural causes on November 19, 2017, at the age of 83. Shoko Asahara Shoko Asahara was the leader of a cult called Aum Shinrikyo, which was established in the year 1984. The group started as a yoga and meditation class, but evolved into something more extreme under Asahara's guidance. Asahara claimed to be the second coming of Jesus and predicted an impending Armageddon, convincing his followers that they were the chosen ones who would survive. Asahara was one of the 13 cult members scheduled to be executed for their involvement in the attacks on the Tokyo subway in 1995. Aum Shinrikyo, the cult led by Asahara, was responsible for these heinous acts. The cult had amassed a significant following throughout Japan, with thousands of believers who subscribed to Asahara's doomsday prophecies. Aum Shinrikyo had also accumulated substantial personal assets, with estimates of their wealth exceeding a billion dollars. Asahara, a partially blind man with long hair and a beard, presented himself as the second coming of Jesus and claimed to possess supernatural powers. In one disturbing interview, Asahara demonstrated these alleged powers by seemingly imparting superhuman abilities to an attendee. However, these claims and manipulations served as a backdrop to his sinister plot. The Tokyo subway happened on 20 March 1995, when several members carried out a deadly attack in the Tokyo subway system. They released sarin gas, a lethal nerve agent, in a crowded subway station during rush hour. The attack resulted in the deaths of 13 people and more than 6,000 people injured. Although Asahara was not directly involved in the attack, his teachings and influence played a significant role in motivating his followers. The beliefs of Aum Shinrikyo were controversial and elitist, as they looked down upon other groups and organizations. Asahara's claims and the group's actions led to their classification as a terrorist organization rather than a legitimate religious group. Before the subway attack, Asahara had gained some respect and was even interviewed by a famous actor and comedian, Takashi Kitano. However, the interview does not reveal anything particularly disturbing, although it is unsettling to consider that many of Asahara's initial followers were young individuals. Following the subway attack, Japanese authorities cracked down on Aum Shinrikyo. Asahara and several top leaders were arrested, and their compounds were raided. Asahara was found guilty of multiple charges, including murder, and was sentenced to death. On July 6, 2018, Asahara was executed along with six other cult members. His baseless doomsday predictions had ultimately come true, albeit on a much smaller and more personal scale than he envisioned. David Berg When you hear the name Children of God, naturally, you will assume and of course think that they are a group of devout and pious worshippers. However, in this case, it's a different story that even the universe will twist to hear this. The Children of God, founded by David Berg, was essentially a communist cult with a distorted interpretation of Christianity. Their methods of recruiting new members involved engaging in sexual relationships with them. In 1968, Berg started this cult in Huntington Beach, California, where he preached about revolution, happiness, and the impending end of times. He claimed that God loves sex because it represents love, while Satan despises it because it is beautiful. That's like a truth blended in shadows, but these beliefs were just the surface of the disturbing practices within the cult. Berg had a disturbing affinity for young girls, and he actively encouraged adults in his cult to engage in intimate relationships with underage victims. The depths of the victims' ages are truly unsettling, and it is better left unexplored. What's even more troubling is that Berg urged his female followers to participate in flirty fishing, a practice where they would use sex as a means to entice outsiders into joining the cult. The atrocities committed by these individuals go far beyond what we can discuss here, and it is truly horrifying. During the only available interview with Berg, he provided a glimpse into his Christian beliefs by asserting that the love of God surpasses all other Christian commandments. According to him, loving God is sufficient, and as long as people do that, all other teachings can be suppressed. In his view, this one law of love fulfills all the Ten Commandments, and everything else, 
loving the Lord with all one's heart and loving one's neighbors as oneself, is the only religion that matters. Apart from functioning as a debaucherous den disguised as a church, the children of God remained united by their belief in an impending disaster. They considered themselves martyrs with the ability to save the world from the Antichrist. To sustain themselves, they would engage in street performances and at times even beg for groceries. But to everyone's shock, about 90% of their earnings would go directly into Berg's pockets. As allegations of abuse and misconduct began to pile up against the community, the Children of God was disbanded, or at least their name was changed, out of fear of prosecution. David Berg went into hiding for the rest of his life until his death in 1994 from natural causes. However, his cult splintered and was succeeded by various individuals in different parts of the world, spreading a harmful doctrine that continues to afflict the minds of the innocent. Anne Hamilton Byrne why has the worrisome tale of Anne become one of the most disturbing interviews with evil cult leaders? This is the reality of Anne who revealed the story of her life with an Australian cult. She was born in 1921 and had a difficult upbringing. Her father couldn't find work to support the family, and her mother was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia and passed away in a mental hospital. This led Anne to be placed in foster care, where she spent most of her childhood in different homes. The real tragedy in Anne's story occurred when she lost her first child in a tragic car accident. People cope with grief differently, but Anne's response was beyond imagination. She became a yoga teacher and attracted a following of middle-aged housewives from Melbourne. From there, she delved into Eastern religions, teaching her students a blend of Hinduism, Buddhism, and Christianity. At this point, Anne's mind was so distorted that she believed she was on the same level as Christ, Buddha, and Krishna. She was brainwashed by her teachings, and so were her followers. They were under her spell, giving her anything she wanted, including their money, homes, and even their children. Things took a darker turn when Anne manipulated her followers into bringing not only their children, but also snatching children from the streets. In total, she had 28 children in her care. To further control them, their identities were changed, false birth certificates were provided, their last names were altered to Hamilton Byrne, and their hair was dyed blonde. It was all done to convince them that they were one big family. However, it took one brave victim, Sarah Moore, to put an end to this sadistic cult. Sarah was expelled from the group in 1987 due to her rebellious behavior against Anne. She went to the police and a raid was conducted. The children were taken into protective custody and Anne fled the country. Eventually, she was arrested in 1993 on fraud charges. But the story doesn't end there. Despite subjecting people to emotional trauma and chronic substance abuse, Anne served very little time in jail. She was only ordered to pay damages to numerous individuals for the psychological abuse they endured. Anne Hamilton Burns' husband passed away in 2001 and she made her only public appearance following her conviction at his funeral. In her later years, it was reported that she resided in a nursing home in Melbourne and was dealing with dementia. During this time, an internal struggle for leadership of the group was said to be unfolding. Sarah Hamilton Byrne, a key figure in the cult, passed away in 2016 at the age of 46. Anne Hamilton Byrne herself died on June 13, 2019, at the age of 97. That's how Anne lived and left such a terrible imprint in the sand of time ever to be remembered for her scandals. Subscribers pick. Here is the picture of a soul with drips of his own blood ready for a bloodbath. But what happened to him? In a quiet town, a cult led by a man preyed on the lives of his innocent followers. One of their victims was a young boy, murdered by the cult leader himself. Hiding under a religious sect, this man personified wickedness. Tragically, the boy's spirit returned, seeking revenge and to expose his wickedness. The ghostly figure of the boy was scarring and adorned with menacing horns. He was a symbol of the pain he endured and his burning desire for justice. This wicked cult leader, burdened by guilt, felt the presence of the boy growing stronger. Nightmares plagued his sleep, and he knew his time for reckoning had come. With unwavering determination, the vengeful spirit revealed the cult's secrets, laying bare the crimes committed under his command. Nevertheless, 
All thanks to Karma for bringing a whole lot of these evil leaders to daylight, including those who claim they govern the universe, as this video reveals the most disturbing interviews with evil cult leaders. But what do you think about the activities of these evil men? Join the conversation in the comment section and lend your voice on this matter. Keith Renier So, we've got Keith Renier, the ringleader of a crazy sex cult called NXEVM. This guy had some seriously messed up stuff going on. He promised people a path to happiness and convinced wealthy folks who felt empty inside that he had all the answers. His company, NXIVM, offered these self-improvement workshops that became super popular in Hollywood and business circles. But here's the thing. Behind the scenes, Rainier was running a full-blown criminal enterprise disguised as a cult. Prosecutors at his trial revealed that some women in NXIVM were not only sexually abused by this guy, but they were also branded with his initials in some secret ceremony. Well, justice finally caught up with Ranier. In September 2021, he got slapped with a whopping 120-year prison sentence for sex trafficking and other crimes. He's spending the rest of his life behind bars. The judge even tacked on a $1.7 million fine just to rub it in. This is a major downfall for a guy who used to be worshipped by his followers. Turns out, he was just a fraudster who manipulated people in NXIVM for money, sex, and power. What a scumbag. During the trial, 15 victims took the stand and shared their gut-wrenching stories. This one woman named Camila, who was abused by Ranier when she was only 15 years old, spoke up first. She talked about how he controlled every aspect of her life, demanded sex whenever he felt like it, and even forced her to have an abortion. Ranier's lawyer tried to defend him, saying he never meant to hurt anyone and that he was just bad at dealing with breakups. But the judge shut him down real quick, calling it an insult to intelligence. One of the victims, India Oxenberg, even talked about how Ranier tried to poison her relationship with her mother. This guy expected her to wait for him naked like a piece of meat. It's horrifying what these people went through. NAXIVM messed with people's heads. They preyed on vulnerable individuals, promising them fulfillment through expensive self-help classes. Even smart, educated folks fell into their trap. It's crazy what people can be manipulated into believing. The trial also uncovered this secret women-only group within NXIVM. In an initiation ceremony, these poor women were lying naked on a table, asking to be branded with a hot pen. Can you imagine? They thought they were joining a mentorship group, but it turned out they were being forced to have sex with Ranier. They were treated like slaves and had to hand over sexually explicit videos as collateral. It's like something out of a horror movie. Thankfully, a jury saw through Ranier's lies and found him guilty on multiple charges, including sex trafficking, racketeering, and child pornography. But get this, Ranier still has a bunch of die-hard supporters who think everything that happened in NXIVM was consensual. They wrote letters to the court begging for leniency. Can you believe that? The individuals who became NXIVM coaches relied on the organization as their source of income. Among them were Mexican immigrants who relied on NXIVM, to maintain their legal status in the United States. They had witnessed the consequences faced by critics of Anxivem, who became targets of private investigators and faced relentless lawsuits. In fact, Claire Bronfman, a prominent figure within NXIVM, had even managed to persuade authorities to launch criminal investigations against some of the critics. When law enforcement finally apprehended Keith Ranieri, the leader of NEXIVM, in 2018, he was found hiding in a closet at a luxurious villa near Puerto Vallarta, Mexico. He had been cohabiting with several women who were also associated with Nexi Ferem. As Ranier was placed in the back of a police car and driven away, the women who had been living with him chased after the vehicle, their emotions running high. Anyway, this whole Nexi Ferem saga reveals how manipulative and dangerous cults can be. It's a relief that Ranier is finally locked away but it's heartbreaking to think about the lives he destroyed. Let's hope the victims can find some semblance of healing and move forward from this nightmare. Rod Farrell Rod Farrell, also known as the Vampire Clan, 
was an American murderer hailing from Kentucky. In the mid-1990s, he led a group that claimed to be vampires. He often portrayed himself as a 500-year-old vampire named Visago. However, his story took a chilling turn when he earned the moniker Vampire Killer due to a horrific crime he committed in 1996. Farrell's victims were Naomi Ruth Queen and Richard Wendorf, the parents of his friend Heather Farrell. Tragically, he brutally beat them to death with a crowbar inside their own home. To intensify the horror, he burned the letter V into Richard Wendorf's body. The shocking nature of the case grabbed widespread attention, and Farrell made headlines as the youngest person in America to be sentenced to death. Ultimately, his sentence was later changed to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. Since then, Farrell has been interviewed on multiple occasions, and his lack of remorse is deeply unsettling. In a documentary recounting the murders, he speaks unusually, using peculiar and sometimes grammatically incorrect sentences. He appears disturbingly proud of his heinous deeds, even drawing comparisons to Satan. What is equally disturbing is his description of the thrill he derived from being on the run, indicating that he remains unchanged and as malevolent as the day he committed those abhorrent acts. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video.